Our first reading is from Luke 23 and from verse 26 to 31. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Today we're going to meditate on the sufferings of Jesus as he went to his cross. Lots of people do that on Good Friday uh, in many Christian traditions. And it's important to say that as we do, we're not coming to this just as mere spectators as though we're just reflecting on the sufferings of Jesus in the hope that somehow that will help us cope with our own suffering. No, as Jesus goes to his cross, we are involved and his suffering is our suffering for he was dying in our place. And for that very reason, Luke doesn't focus very much on the physical sufferings of Jesus, but he puts much more emphasis on the meaning of the cross and the achievement of the cross. So as they led Jesus away to be crucified, the torture and beating that he had already received, which Luke hardly describes, that had left him too weak to carry his own cross. So they gave it to Simon of Cyrene to carry. Now, one of the interesting sidelights of, of, of Luke's gospel is the number of nations that are included. Um, he often talks, uh, Luke records um, the, the Samaritans, the parable of the good Samaritan and so on. Um, and other nations that have dealings with Jesus. And here is Simon of Cyrene. He's probably Jewish, and he's come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover, but he's from Cyrene, what we would call today Libya. He's an African, a North African. Um, and Luke mentions all these characters in Luke and in Acts. He weaves them into his story because he's telling us this is a good news, not just for Israel, but for all the world, for every nation. Now, there's a great crowd that are following Jesus along his journey. And many of them are weeping and lamenting, especially the women. You could understand that, couldn't you? The kind of scenes that would be seen at a, a public execution. Maybe some of these people have witnessed the miracles that Jesus did. And now they are staggered that that man they heard preach, that man who opened the eyes of the blind and so on, is now being taken out to be executed. They're amazed to see a good man being led out to die. But listen to what Jesus says to them. Verse 28. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. What a powerful statement. Jesus is taking death upon himself so that others need not fear death and they might be able to, to face death without, um, without fear, uh, to face death with hope. Um, but what about those who reject him? What about those who want him dead, who want him done away with? who have rejected everything that he has proclaimed and everything that he is. And that is where Luke begins his account of the cross. If you like, there is a sort of an escalator going on through these passages. We're starting at the very bottom and coming closer to those who come to trust uh, in Jesus. There's a sort of gospel dimension here. Weep for those who reject Jesus, says Jesus. Weep for those who reject me. Weep for yourselves. Weep for those who say, he cannot be our saviour. Now, we've seen in the parable of the tenants in, in chapter 20, and in the long Olivet Discourse in chapter 21 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, um, because Jesus rejected her Messiah, there was to be a day of reckoning coming. God had sent his Messiah, and that generation had rejected him. And so in verses 29 and 30, when he, he talks about the barren and the wombs that never bore and the people calling the mountains and the hills to cover them and so on, he is 
describing what will happen in AD 70 when Jerusalem will be raised to the ground. And it's a very strong theme throughout this gospel, isn't it? We can identify with that now, can't we? We've seen Ukrainian families and we've seen them witnessing their homes raised to the ground, coming out of their basements and seeing the whole city lying in ruins and desperately filled with grief. And that was the experience of Jerusalem. And then Jesus adds these mysterious words, and I want to dwell on these for a moment. Verse 31, for if they do these, if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? That's a mysterious comment, isn't it? If they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Who are the they? Well, Jesus is being led out to Calvary by the Romans, and they will be the ones who execute judgment on Jerusalem in, in later years. Jesus is innocent. Pilate has stated that at his trial three times in the earlier part of this chapter. He is so innocent that it's like taking a green tree and chopping it down. What a terrible thing to do. What a waste of a tree that's still growing and still full of sap and, and uh, uh, still going to reach its full potential and you cut it down when it is green. What a stupid thing to do. We cut trees down when they're full grown. We cut them down perhaps when they're, some parts of them are dying off and they're a danger and we want to take them out to stop them falling on anybody. When they have turned dry. Jesus is, if you like, the tree in full green leaf and, and in the prime of life. And everything he's done is righteous. And these men, they, the Roman soldiers, are doing this when the wood is green to the one who is innocent. The one who does not deserve to die. And Jesus is warning the people of Jerusalem, look, if they do this to me when the wood is green, what will happen to those who've rejected God? What will happen to those who have Rule God out of their lives. Weep for yourselves. For they, the Romans, will come back to execute a far greater justice to far more people. And that is what you should weep for. Now that sense of dryness is very powerful, isn't it? That gives us reason to weep today. For the spiritual dryness of our culture. We see... Too many churches that reject the claims of Jesus, that deny the authority of God's word, that deny his sacrificial work on the cross, that it actually achieved anything. They say it's just a great example of love and that's all there is to the cross. Jesus moving us by his dying example to make us love him more because he loves us. No, there is something much richer going on at the cross. And we see the wider culture rejecting God defying the God who has made himself known in Jesus and, and using God's name and Jesus' name as, as swear words. And so our culture is wandering further and further away from God and we should weep for it. We should weep for that culture. We should weep for ourselves and the lost world around us. But we shouldn't weep most of all because... Jesus is this most wonderful saviour, the saviour the world needs to hear of, the saviour we need to trust in. And his grace is still available today, even though people are rejecting it. And his grace is still changing lives. He is still the one in whom we can find forgiveness, as we're going to see as this chapter works itself out. Somebody I follow on Twitter is a pastor down in, in Monmouthshire. Um, he went to a church of six people, a little chapel in, in the... Um, very depressed areas of the South Wales Valleys. Seven years ago, there was about six people there. Today, there's probably a hundred people. And uh, he showed on Twitter the leaflet that he put out um, for Easter. And he said, there are loads of people in this town. Seven years ago, they would have said, we never would have gone near a church. And now they're Christians. <laughs> so if you've never gone near a church, come to our church, he was saying. Yeah, that's the spirit we should have, isn't it? To say to people, look, this saviour is still our saviour and we weep for you if you still reject him. Now Jake's going to come and read us the uh, next part of the chapter, 32 to 43. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. 
for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you, Jake. Jesus was not led out to execution alone. I wonder who those two criminals were. We'd love to know, wouldn't we, their stories. Uh, Matthew calls them robbers. Um, Elsewhere, I think they're called murderers. Uh, They have killed others and they've been crucified with Jesus but only Luke records the conversation that they have and there's a the progression in this passage first of all Jesus prays for the Roman soldiers who nail him up to die verse 34 Jesus said father forgive them for they know not what they do to the Roman soldiers this was a Jewish matter uh, and they had no understanding of the issues involved. These are just this is three Jews that we've been told to execute. Let's get on with it. It's a job. We've got our orders. <coughs> and they cast lots for his garments, just as had been prophesied in Psalm 22, all those hundreds of years before. Uh, but they did not know that. They were Roman soldiers, completely ignorant of the Old Testament. And therefore, Jesus asks his father to forgive them for what they have done. Now, the religious leaders were a very different story. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. And that was common when someone was crucified. I don't know if you've ever pondered this, but crucifixion gives the crowd the opportunity to mock the person, even to their face, while they're dying. I don't know if you've seen the film Spartacus, where his family come and and, and, and talk to him while he's hanging there dying. Um, and you know, that, that was the horrible nature of crucifixion. Um, people came to laugh in their face. And Luke records their words because they're so ironic. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. How could this man be the Christ? How could a man dying under a curse? Be the great Messiah that they've been longing for. The law of Moses said, cursed is every man who who dies on a tree, who's hung from a tree. And in every sense, that's true of Jesus, isn't it? He is indeed under a curse. This is the man who has claimed to raise the dead and drive out demons and heal the sick. Why would he just hang there if he is the great Messiah? Surely in this moment of his greatest weakness, this is the moment to show his power. But the saving strength of Jesus is made perfect in his weakness. It is as he bears our sin that he does the greatest deed of all. And he dies under the wrath of God so that he can save. He saved others because he did not save himself. And then the soldiers join in the mocking. Uh, They've heard them uh, talking about him as a king and they pick up on that. What kind of a king is this? If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself, they mockingly say, knowing that they've nailed him there and there's nothing he can do. What kind of a king hangs on a cross wearing a crown of thorns? How ridiculous. And they wrote their mocking notice on a piece of paper and, and nailed it to the cross. This is the king of the Jews. It seemed like kingdom, authority and power was as far away from him as possible. And yet he is building his kingdom through the very act of his dying. 
This is the king of the universe, and as, as it says in Stainer's crucifixion, this is his throne, from the throne of his cross, the king of grief cries out to a world in its unbelief. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Well, if the crowd and the soldiers are mocking Jesus, the two criminals who are dying with him are divided. Now, we expect one of them to be bitter, don't we? And to be filled with self-pity. He blasphemes Jesus. He repeats the taunt of the crowd. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. If you really are the saviour, this would be a great time to save us. He says through the gritted teeth of his own agony. Here's a man who's lived a cynical life. He has um, taken other people's lives in order to get their property and their money. Um, he doesn't care about anybody else than himself. He didn't care about the future and now he's got the just desserts for his crimes. And he is desperate and cynical in his death. But then we hear another voice. It's the voice of the criminal the other side of Jesus. And he reproves him. Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. You see, this man is looking beyond his death, isn't he? He's sobered up by the reality of his own imminent death. And he's looking into eternity. And he's realizing that he's thrown away his life. He's only had one life and it's gone and it's all flashing before him. And he's facing the reality that he will very soon meet God. And face God's justice as well. And he's worked out that he has nothing to offer God. Nothing that will count in God's divine reckoning. And the contrast between these two criminals... And Jesus crucified between them could not be more stark, could it? If Jesus stood among us today, we would feel our sinfulness, wouldn't we? In comparison with him. Have you ever found yourself in that situation? Now, I imagine a farmer who's been muck spreading in his fields and he's had an accident and he's been put in an ambulance and rushed to hospital and, and all the nurses and doctors that come around him are all, you know, clad in plastic gloves, rubber gloves and overalls and they're perfectly clean and septic and by comparison he's in a real mess and he stinks. You know, that's, that's what it's like on these crosses, isn't it? The one who is in the middle is God himself and without sin. We indeed justly suffer, but this man has done nothing wrong. But then listen to the way that this dying thief speaks to Jesus. Look at the words he uses in verse 42. He begins by saying, Jesus. Isn't that lovely? Jesus. He knows, he knows what that name means, presumably, if he's Jewish. He knows that it means saviour. And he needs him to be his saviour, to take away his sin. I'm sure that's why Luke has written it down. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In all this baying crowd of people gathered around the cross, this is the first man who has shown Jesus respect and trust. He has realised that when Jesus dies, he will be entering into his eternal kingdom as the Son of God. Into heaven itself. And he says, remember me. Be my advocate. Jesus is going into the holy court of heaven and he has every right to do so. And he's saying, plead for me. Plead my cause. Be my advocate. He's got no hope in himself, no claim that could impress God. Jesus is his only hope. And Jesus answers with a promise that can be relied on. That's why it begins with these words, truly I say to you. Every time Jesus gives us a gospel promise, that's, that's how he begins it, or very similar. Today I say to you, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke could have talked about the agonizing sufferings of Jesus and the darkness and the sense of abandonment. He could have talked about divine justice being meted out on Jesus. Instead, he chooses to give us this story of forgiveness. Isn't that so powerful? Of a man who is the worst outcast being reconciled to God. 
And because he trusts in Jesus, that day, even as he hung on the cross, he became a Christian. And if we will do the same, if we will come and trust in Jesus as our king, we have access to God. We have an advocate, a friend in heaven who pleads our cause when we pray and we have nothing to fear when we face death. Now Ruth is going to come and read to us the final description of the death of Jesus. Verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness <clears throat> over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. The final thing Luke describes is the darkness. The darkness that covered Jerusalem. Now we don't know how that happened. Uh, it couldn't have been an eclipse of the sun because, uh, as you will have seen, looking in the sky uh, at night at the moment, it's a full moon when we get to Passover, um, and you can't have an eclipse at full moon. Um, so it couldn't be an eclipse of the sun, and it also lasted three hours. And if you remember um, the eclipse when it pass, passed over Britain um, 20 years ago or so, um, it's very quick, isn't it? It's just half an hour. It wouldn't explain three hours of darkness. It must have been some other miraculous phenomenon, maybe a dense cloud that blocked out the light of the sun. Something truly uh, strange and supernatural. And what a symbol of what is going on here. Remember, Jesus had said to Judas uh, in the garden, chapter 2, verse 53, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now on the cross, Jesus experiences the darkness of the Father's face being turned away. God the Father's wrath falls on the Son. And the God the Father's love is absent. He knows only the wrath of God in his spiritual agony as well as his physical agony. And this is how we understand the seriousness of sin. This is where we measure the justice of a holy God, isn't it? God had taught holiness to the people of Israel through all the sacrifices that they conducted um, after the journey of the Exodus and, and in the tabernacle and then when they built it in the temple. Um, they were, if you like, visual aids to teach them the reality of God's holiness. And if you wanted to enter the, the building of the temple itself, uh, the holy place, the outer room, you could only do that if you were a priest and, and it was your turn to go in and to offer incense. And only the chief priest could go beyond that be, through the veil, the, the curtain that um, uh, hung over the holiest of holies, uh, the inner room of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the, the chief priest only did that once a year and they were worried even then that he might be struck dead. So he never went in without a rope attached to his foot. Should he be struck dead in the Holy of Holies, they could drag him from God's presence. That's how God taught them holiness. And now, as Jesus dies, God teaches, uses it to teach us another great lesson as well. The chiefest high priest of all, the greatest high priest of all, Jesus himself is on the cross making the greatest sacrifice of himself. And at that point, Luke tells us here, verse 45, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Matthew tells us that the earth shook and maybe that disturbed the walls of the temple and, and forced a rip from the top to the bottom. Normally you would rip something from the bottom, wouldn't you, in those situations, if, if it was a human doing this. But this is God, by an act of God, 
declaring to the world that there is a new and living way that has been made into God's presence. And then, with his work complete, Jesus makes his final confident cry to his Father. Father, verse 46, into your hands I commit my spirit. He knew where he was going. He knew where his home was. He knew where he would be after he died. The only innocent man who has ever lived has died. And his sacrifice has been accepted. So that he can enter God's presence. And we can do so as well.